Amen. I'm glad I'm here today. I'm glad I'm here if I'm here in this world. Put it that way. That's the best way to say it. And he will come again. And I marvel at the way things are beginning to develop. And the, sun, the soon, I believe, soon coming of the Lord. I can't set a date. Nobody can do that. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 1, with me this morning, please. Daniel. Daniel, chapter number 1. Daniel chapter 1, and verse number 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Father, bless your word now. Bless your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Just imagine being carried off from your homeland, taken away from your place of birth into a foreign land. That's bad enough. But then on top of that, they're going to change you. They're going to make you one of them. They're going to change your name, which means they're going to change your identity, and they want you to become a Babylonian. So therefore, they could not stand the names of Daniel or Hananiah, or Mishael, or Azariah. And the reason, because all of these names glorify the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So they can't, have, they can't have that. So therefore, they have to change their identity. Now that's exactly what's happening to you today. They're changing your identity. They're trying to form you in their own likeness. They create gods, and then they form you in the image of these gods that they create. And why do they do that? Because they can't stand the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate him. And that's a marvelous thing to think about that. There must be some sort of evil working when you hate the Lord Jesus Christ. For no man ever died for another man like he did for us. No man ever walked this earth and loved men like the Lord Jesus loves men. And there is only one seated at the right hand of the Father who is able to plead for our cause. All the rest of the gods are nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything. So this issue in the book of Daniel, first of all, starts with identity. If they can take their Hebrew identity from them and mold them into a Babylonian, they're going to make a fatal strike against these Hebrews, and they're going to show the world that the God of Israel is just another tribal God like all the rest of them. But God's got something He's going to say about that. Look at chapter number 2 and verse number 31 of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 31. The Lord appears and he gives, a, he gives a dream to the king. And in verse number 31 through 35, he tells you, he, the scripture tells you what this dream is. He said, O king, saw us, behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Terrible in the sense that it creates terror. That's what the word means here. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, and his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. King, thou sawest till the stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. Mountain means kingdom and fill the whole earth. So the Lord, even though his people are in captivity, even though Jeremiah walked through the streets of Jerusalem and wept over the fact that they would be carried off into captivity, and they fought him over it, and Jeremiah said, Listen, this is the will of God. You're going into captivity. Seventy years you'll be there until the land enjoys its Sabbath. And so God gave them prophet after prophet after prophet, and they refused to listen to the voice of the prophets, and so they wind up in Babylon. 
So you're going to say, what about my God? What happened to him? I'm here in captivity. Where was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel that promised us a homeland? Where is he? What happened to him? And the Lord raises up a prophet. He raises up a prophet while they're in captivity, my friend, that is not surpassed by any prophet in that Bible, Genesis through Revelation. This prophet is a prophet called Daniel. His name in Hebrew means... Elohim will judge. The word Dan in Hebrew is judge. So the judgment of Elohim, the judgment of Daniel, that God uses Daniel not only to judge the children of Israel, but mainly to judge the king of Babylon. And to show that the sovereignty of God doesn't stop at the borders of Israel, but the sovereignty of God moves all over the face of all the earth. You look about you this morning and you say to yourself, everything is out of control. No, my dear friend. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The sovereignty of God is a big issue in the beginning of the book of Daniel. You must understand that it is all important to know that God is in charge. Look at chapter number 4 and verse number 25 in the book of Daniel. Chapter 4 verse 25. The Bible says in Daniel chapter number 4 and verse number 25. Let me find it here. Here we go. Daniel 4:25. They shall drive thee from among men, and thy dwelling shall be as the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen. Can you imagine the king of Babylon on his hands and knees eating grass like an oxen? And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. In other words, seven years you're going to be out there in the field till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Amen. 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 Nebuchadnezzar would have, a, would have a tendency to take glory, to be praised, because he is the ruling monarch of the earth. His empire is the greatest there is. And God puts him down on his hands and knees and makes him live like an animal for seven years. Even though Israel is in captivity and they're underneath his rule, he lets Nebuchadnezzar know that God still rules regardless of who sits on the seat. And he still does <coughs> chapter number 5 and verse number 5 we read in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote all against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote and the king's countenance was changed mine would have been too and so would you for what you are reading here is a hand that appears while Belshazzar the son of Nebuchadnezzar, as the kingdom progresses through the genealogies, through the, through the monarchy, through the families, and Belshazzar takes the, he takes the implements that were taken from the temple of God, and he drinks wine to his gods. Oh, what a mockery he makes of that which is holy. Remember what that Bible says, give not that which is holy to the dogs, cast not your pearls before swine. Belshazzar had no respect for what these things had been used for. And my dear friend, a hand appears, many, many tickle your fars, and he couldn't read it. He couldn't understand what that meant, so he needed Daniel. And he called him up, uh, and here it says in chapter number 5 and verse number 18 of the book of Daniel, chapter 5, 18, O thou king, Daniel gives him the interpretation again. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for the majesty he gave all people, nations, languages, trembled and feared before him. Whom he would he slew, whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. He had absolute power as a monarch has, my dear friend. This is not a parliament. This is not a congress. This is a, mon this is a king that had the power of life and death in his hands. But God is saying even though he had that kind of power, the one that allowed it or gave it to him in a passive sense is still God and he's going to speak to you now, Belshazzar. Look at verse number 4 of the book of Daniel chapter number 5. Daniel 5, 4, and they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, brass, iron, wood, and of stone. Here's what will get you in trouble. 
This will get you in trouble real fast. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. I am God, he said, and beside me there is none other. And we live in a culture that's trying their dead level best to pull him down. To stop him under their feet. My friend, what a fool. <laughs> what a fool. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob cannot be pulled down. He's going to come down. And when he comes down, they're not going to like what happens. In verse number 25, chapter number 5 of the book of Daniel. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharzin. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and have found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. Now they hate Daniel. All liberal scholarship hates Daniel. They hate it because it gives you an accurate picture of the progressive Gentile kingdoms starting with Babylon and the Medes and the Persians, then the Grecians and then the Romans. They say there's no way that Daniel could have prophesied these things. So they ram him up about 200 B.C. or they say there really was no Daniel, that this was probably made during the Maccabean period or something like that. But the Lord Jesus Christ said Daniel was a prophet. And Daniel prophesies a little over 500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ comes into this world. He's there at the time of Babylon. And make no mistake about it, here you read a prophecy that says, King of the Babylonians, your empire is going to be taken. It's going to be split asunder and it goes to the Medes and to the Persians. And there's not a thing in the world he could do about it. It says in verse number 28, Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. Is that what happened in history, preacher? Absolutely. All you have to do is study any secular history and they'll tell you plainly that Babylon was followed by the Medes and the Persians and then by the Grecians and then by the Romans. Look at chapter number 2 of the book of Daniel in verse number 31. Now we get into the prophecy of the book of Daniel. Remember the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy and a book of prophecy makes it important because they're prophesying during the captivity of the people of Israel, the Hebrew people. Chapter number 5, chapter number 2, verse number 31 of the book of Daniel. O king, you saw a great image. And this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee. And the form thereof was full of terror. And what he does is continue to tell him. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Then he talks about this uh, this, this chest right here being of, the, uh, of, of, of brass or, or of silver rather which represents the Medes and the Persians the midsection of brass which represents the Grecian Empire and then the waist down through the legs is iron which represents the Roman Empire he makes it very plain the legs split and when we go back and read history we know at 1040, 1054 AD that the eastern and western branches of the Roman Empire split asunder. And when they were split asunder, we had two completely different forms of this religion that took place. But then what happens is at the bottom, the feet, the extremity, the most extreme part of this image, the iron begins to mix with clay. And this is very important for you to see what he's talking about here. Chapter number 2 and verse number 43. Daniel 2, 43. The feet now, the iron and the clay, are being mixed together. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. Watch this now carefully. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This is a fabricated thing. This is a not, it is a not, it is not a natural thing. Iron and clay cannot mix, but they can coexist. And that's what you have here. You have a coexistence that they show up at the same time. Now clay, the Bible tells you plainly, they live in houses of clay. That's us. But the iron, you need to go back and find out what kind of bed that Og, king of Bashan, slept in. What was that? That was an iron bed. And Og, the king of Bashan, was a giant. So iron in the Bible in the Old Testament is associated with giants. 
Where did they come from? They come from the angels that kept not their first estate, but came down to the daughters of men. They left their home and came down, and giants were born of that union. So therefore we have a supernatural interruption with humanity and it brings about a whole new system of things. And the Lord Jesus Christ through Daniel says this. He says that when you come down to the end of this image, and this image by the way shows up 606 B.C. at the beginning of the Gentile reign on this earth. It is called the times of the Gentiles. At 606 B.C. until the second coming of Christ, when the stone that is cut out of the mountain, that stone that the builders rejected, that builder, that chief corner stone, to the Christian he's precious as he can be. This stone represents the power of God when God opens heaven and that stone comes down and smites that image, not on its head, not on its chest, not on its midsection, but on its feet. Notice carefully, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. It didn't say that they will mingle themselves with men. It said they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. What does that mean, preacher? It means it gets into the actual birthing process. It has to do with how a human being is brought into this world. Medical science, if you want to call it that, has progressed enormously, exponentially, just in the last 20 to 30 years as it comes to the birth of a human being. It's quite a remarkable thing. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter number 12, that knowledge shall increase. They will mingle themselves with the seed of men. The scripture says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he was perfect in his generations. That Hebrew word translated perfect is tanin. It means that Noah was a pure human being. That's important. He was a pure human being. He was no hybrid. He had not been, uh, he had not been uh, 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 problem. He had not been con con uh, affected by the, the angels that kept not their first estate. So God through Noah preserves the human race over the flood. Eight souls inhabit a new world. And Noah is the father of these eight souls because he is a pure human being. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here 2,000 years ago, he was a pure human being. He said, they said, he is without sin. And so he was. So I'm not going to do further with that right now, but I want you to understand something. At the very end of the Gentile kingdoms, it is so perverted and distorted that it can no longer be rep recognized as a human kingdom. It is now a hybrid uh, monstrosity that has developed in the last days. Do you think something like that is happening now? You better believe it is. You're very naive this morning if you don't believe that. Very naive. For example, a virus has been let loose on people. A virus, my dear friend, that came from a lab, a stage four, level four lab, in China. Note carefully, a virus that went from all appearances was, uh, was at least altered in a laboratory that attacks a certain age group of people. All ages have died from it. But a certain age group of people are far more vulnerable to that virus. Did you know? Have you thought about this? That the highest echelons of the China, Chinese government, have you read about one single one of them dying from that virus? Just one, dear friend. Could it be that they already had a vaccine when they set that thing loose on humanity that would take care of themselves? Listen carefully. You, this is called biological warfare. They can program 
a virus that would go after oriental people or program a virus that would go about a certain race of people we're getting into twilight zone dear friends and be careful hold on it is not something that you want to be part of even so come lord jesus come look at daniel chapter number nine now i can't preach the whole book of daniel this morning I'm trying, and I, you know, I won't even get into the den of lions and Daniel and, 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 and how he faced them off. If you want to see a beautiful picture of the den of lions, it's on my wall in here, in my office. You see, Daniel's one of my heroes, folks. Yes, he is. He's one of my heroes. Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. After Daniel had prayed and fasted and sought the face of God for his people, the Lord gave Daniel the prophecy of the 70 weeks. In this 70 weeks of prophecy, he talks about the rebuilding of the temple. Then he talks about the Messiah showing up and then he's cut off. Well, this all happened. And that fulfills 69 weeks of that 70 weeks of prophecy. But it leaves one week. This is why you hear people talking all the time about 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Now, a week in the scriptures that's used here represents a year, not a day, not a week of seven days. And what we have here is seven is the 70th week, which is a period of seven years. And that matches completely the tribulation period that's coming on this earth. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it will last seven years. This seven year period of time, God's going to use it for a purpose. Note carefully. In chapter number 12, and uh, in, it, rather back in chapter number 9, and verse number 25, look at this. 9.25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem but seven weeks, three score and two, the streets shall be built in the wall in troublous times. And look at verse number 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause what? You don't sacrifice in a synagogue. You sacrifice in a temple. There's going to be a temple rebuilt during the tribulation period look at Ma look at the book of uh, Daniel chapter number 9 verse number 27 look at what he says in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse 15 Matthew 24 verse 15 in Matthew 24 verse 15 the Lord Jesus Christ said this note carefully the context is purely Jewish purely Hebrew verse verse 15 when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, stand where? The synagogue has no holy place. This is the temple. The Lord Jesus Christ told his people that there's going to be a temple and the Antichrist is going to stand in it. Wait a minute. He just tells them there's not going to be one stone upon another. It's going to be torn down. And so it was in 70 AD by Titus, yet it will be rebuilt. And in that temple, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did, he's going to walk in there and declare himself to be God. And so, my friend, we're going to come down to the end. We're going to come to it quickly. We Notice, it's, it's very important to understand this now. A sacrifice, an oblation, and a holy place can only be fulfilled in a temple. You, been, you need to be watching... For the temple, be very careful about a temple. So this is where the peace process starts, preacher, I believe so. I believe the covenant that Israel makes with the Antichrist allows them to build their temple. And for seven years they have their temple. And the Antichrist comes into that temple and professes to be God. Now turn to Revelation, I mean Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel 12 and verse 1. We're coming down to the end of the book of Daniel, and we're coming down to the end of days, as they call it. Or the end of the times of the Gentiles. Look at the connection Daniel makes with the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince 
which standeth for the children of Israel, thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Is, the, is Michael mentioned in Revelation? Turn to chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And verse number 7. Revelation 12, 7. Do you see now why so many of the old timers used to tell you that Daniel and Revelation go together? They do. Look at chapter number 12 of Revelation. And verse number 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. Who's the dragon? The dragon's Satan. Satan appears in many different forms in the Bible. He appears as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may... Well, how can he do that? He's a spirit being, that's how. He's a spirit being. We've got war in heaven. We've got Michael and his angels fighting against Satan. Daniel told you in chapter number 12 that in the end that Michael shall stand for his people. Michael always stands for Israel. He's their guardian angel for the whole nation. We have ever re Michael is an archangel. That's what he's called. Michael the archangel. The chiefest among angels. He's a powerful angel. Why the battle? That's only God only knows what legal ground God gives to Satan. He gives him one last opportunity and he goes up against an archangel and of course he loses. Now what happens in chapter number 12 of Revelation? He comes down to persecute who? The woman. Who's the woman? Israel. How do you know that? All you got to do is go back in the book of Genesis and read what Joseph said when he gave his prophecy of the children of Israel. A woman persecuted by Satan. And so let's go back and read what he said in Daniel chapter number 12. It's a wonderful thing. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that time, tribulation. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come when Daniel finishes him. In that battle, that legal authority, Satan no longer has access to heaven. And it's not long after that before he's taken and cast into a lake of fire. But first he's put into a bottomless pit and spends a thousand years there. Then he's let out of that bottomless pit and goes out and deceives the nations one more time. And then he's taken and cast into the lake of fire. Now I want to finish it up with this. I want you to follow me on this. This is very important. Look at Daniel chapter number 12 and verse 4. But thou, o Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, he really means that. How many in here, if you're, if you're 30 years old or younger, would you stand up, please? If you're 30 years old or younger. All right. Now, look at this. God's blessed us with a lot of young people, hasn't he? Amen. All right. They don't know your world, folks. I'm 73. They don't know my world. They don't know, they don't know a world where there was no cell phones. They don't know that world. They don't know the world where there was nanotechnology. They don't know anything about it. The only world they've ever known is the world they've been living in. And a lot of them in here are under 20. All right, y'all can go ahead and be seated a minute. Let me talk about knowledge being increased. Transportation. From a horse and buggy, did you know that just a few minutes ago, just a few minutes ago, two astronauts came upon this, uh, this uh, space, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, the, way, the station, the, way, the space station. I can't think of the name of it. The what? Yeah. It's traveling 70,000 miles an hour. This is what they said. And they have to go and they have to connect with that. And these two astronauts, 
sent into space by a private company, SpaceX. Elon Musk, a South African, started the company, owns the company, and now here he is sending people up to space stations. Elon Musk. Now, can you imagine that? Have you any idea right now what's going on? <laughs> From a horse and a buggy to two astronauts that have just connected with a space station. We had a telegraph. Okay. Then we had a telephone. And now we have cell phones. And I have a cell phone in my pocket that probably has a hundred times the computing power of the first computers that filled up a whole room. And you got it in your pocket right now. Computers, supercomputers, unbelievable power of these computers, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, Crick back in the 50s discovered DNA. That is the code of life. RNA reads it and applies it. They didn't know anything about that 100 years ago. Biological warfare. You're dealing with it right now. You see something come up on the stage. It appears all of a sudden. Biological warfare. Let me tell you something. I don't believe everything in anything that comes down the pike. And I'm going to tell you something. Be honest with you now this morning. I want to be as honest as I know how. When all this stuff started with COVID-19, I, I, was, I, was, I, I listened. And I watched. I observed. I did a lot of reading. I thought, well, now let's listen to these people. Let's find out what's going on. I'm going to tell you what I, how I feel. There is no doubt that there is a virus killing people. I don't question that for a minute. But they're using that virus, and they're using it against you. And I do not believe that most of the people in this country talking about the virus have a, any idea what they're talking about. There's something going on that you're not getting. Heart transplants. Can you imagine that? Heart transplants. Then we have nanotechnology, artificial, tech, artificial intelligence, so forth and so on. Let me read you this, and then we'll come to a close. Buckminster Fuller created the knowledge doubling curve. He noticed that until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today, things are not as simple as different types of knowledge have different rates of growth. For example, nanotechnology knowledge is doubling every two years and clinical knowledge every 18 months. But on average, human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. Wrap your mind around that for a moment. According to IBM, the build out of the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. In plain words, in one week's time, your world can change completely. And you have no idea how it's going to change and what's going to happen. We live in strange times. Now let's continue. If it can reach the point of doubling in 12 hours, why couldn't it double in 6 hours? Why couldn't it double in three hours? Why couldn't it get to the point to where it's just exponentially doubling and doubling and doubling because of the forces able to do it with supercomputers and all the rest of that that's working? Why not? Where are we? I think God has to intervene because they were going to build. You remember they were building this tower? You remember Nimrod? You remember that? Not Nimrod? Let's build a tower. That God said, if we don't go down there and intervene, Anything they desire to do, they'll be able to do it. That's man. That's us. That's you. That's your capabilities. God will only let us get so far, then he'll... Amen. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe it. I firmly believe it. You don't trust the government, do you? You don't trust people, do you? I don't trust them. There's only one I trust, and that's the Lord. Say, so why don't you trust the people? Because who knows their ulterior motive for anything they get into? Most of them, it's money-driven. Some of them, it's power-driven. But I trust the Lord. I'm going to tell you something now, and I'm going to close. This is strange times. They're telling us, get ready for a second wave. They're saying we may hit with a second wave of this virus. 
Maybe what they're saying is that they're going to release, the Chinese are going to release another virus, and that next virus is going to, it's going to, it's probably going to affect you in different ways. It's going to pinpoint races or whole, whole groups of people. Who knows? Who knows? But I know the one who's in control. Hope you're ready. Oh, we'll be leaving out of here anytime. Amen. I'll see you going up. I'll meet you by the river. Amen. I'll meet you by the river. Father, bless your word. I pray I said something this morning, Heavenly Father, if nothing else, it got people to thinking. If nothing else, it got them to thinking. In Jesus' name I pray.